The Italian editor Pietro Scalia is one of the most significant film editors of the last 50 years, having worked with auteurs like Oliver Stone, Ridley Scott, Bernardo Bertolucci, Gus Van Sant, Sam Raimi, and even Michael Bay. He was honored at Locarno this year with the Vision Award and chose to screen two of his films to mark the occasion, Goodwill Hunting and Black Hawk Down. So Pietro, thanks for joining us. Um, look, you've had, you were in the middle of, I will say, a remarkable career. You know, you've worked with the greatest directors of your generation. You've made big hit movies for over 40 years. You've won multiple Oscars. Um, and now you're receiving the Vision Award at Locarno Film Festival. And to mark that, you've chosen to screen Good Will Hunting and Black Hawk Down, which are two very, very different films. And I'm interested to know why you chose those. Um, thank you for, for that. I mean, yes, I mean, sometimes it seems surreal, you know. I mean, the, the, the great fortune I've had, you know, to really uh, work with uh, amazing people. But th those two films... Um, I don't know. I think uh, that, for example, Black, they seem, uh, let's start that way, that the two films completely different on the surface. But there was, I wanted to show them because they, they have some things that are similar, at least uh, for, for me, or, or they have some connections uh, that I wanted to maybe uh, point out to, to, uh, to viewers. Also, I mean, they're Older films. I mean, time passes me by. They're like twenty and or twenty-five years old. Uh, you know, they so, feel quite recent to me. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know. I mean, uh, they're, they're films that people, you know, have come across. Always said they really mean something to them. Uh, Black Hawk Down, emotional, uh, but also uh, the experience with Goodwill Hunting. I mean, it's people that are personal. So one thing was for people that hadn't seen them, for new generations to see those films, um, because they're both, uh, I think, emotional in, in their own uh, uh, respect. Um, Goodwill Hunting uh, starts from my love of uh, Gus's movies, and I wanted to work with him, but also coming across this uh, amazing screenplay. You know, and when I had the good fortune to, you know, won an Oscar and to be able to, the, the, the luxury of choice. So it was like, yeah, don't take everything that's offered. I, you know, I'm going to maybe not work for a month. I'm going to wait for that script because that was fundamental for me to get a, a good script, something that moves me story-wise, something that I can, you know, work for uh, a year, something different or something that, you know, is interesting. And it must have been exciting to discover the script was written by two Guys yeah. in their twenties. I didn't know who, who they were. No one's ever heard no, of. No, no. But the script really. So I, I remember I was in tears reading it. I was laughing. I said, "Oh, awesome! I'm going to get to do a comedy." You know, which is like, <laughs> but uh, I was at the time. I asked my agent to you know set up a meeting with Gus. You know, because Gus, it was really a long shot because Gus already had his own editor. But he said, "Can you?" You know, and so forth. And Luckily, I was able to do that and, uh, you know, met with him in Toronto, but he wasn't so, you know, keen on hiring because, oh, you did these big movies, you know, this is a small film, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but uh, I don't know, somehow we hit it off and, uh, you know, we, uh, he asked me to stay for dinner, which was a good sign. Uh, and he says, hey, uh, you want to come and um, meet Matt and Ben before we go to dinner? I said, sure. So we go, in, he was in Toronto. They were going to shoot mostly in Toronto. So we go over to where Matt and Ben were living in this condo. We walk in and it's literally, and also uh, uh, Ben's brother was there, Casey Affleck. But it was literally, they were just in the kitchen, in the living room talking and just like, you know, like college kids, young kids. But it was like literally the movie. I mean, they, they were there. And I turned to Gus and say, can you believe it? I mean, he it says, yeah, I know. It's just like, so that was uh, my introduction to that. And then, uh, but you know, it, the movie, uh, what was great about it was really the, uh, the written word, the dialogues. That's what stood out from, from the script. And, uh, it turned out uh, wonderful, but it was also very, I mean, great performances from Matt and Ben, but also Robin Williams, you know, who uh, won an Oscar for, for that performance. Uh, but for me, it was the, the dialogue and the words, and, and I love dialogue. I love cutting dialogue. 
to say I think like I do big movies and action, but my thing is the written word. I love uh, good, tight dialogue, you know? Well, I actually, I've, I've heard Good Will Hunting be described as an action movie, but with words. Exactly. That's exactly my point. Black Hawk Down is exactly the opposite. It's, it's an action movie with no words, but the action is like dialogue. It had to be exactly as precise and as intricate as I was, I was, as I was cutting dialogue, uh, in, in Goodwill Hunting, because it wasn't, uh, I used the example that it, it was dialogue that was, I constructed it because part of their performances, uh, and that, since they had written and they were so familiar with the word that they would imp- improvise. So a lot of takes, you know, would be, um, changes and they, they would, you know, talk very, uh, very natural, like, like people talk, like on top of each other. Well, that's, uh, that's something that, you know, it's difficult to cut if you, from one thing to the other, because obviously if you, if you have one camera, if you have two cameras, maybe you can cut back and forth, but with one camera, sometimes it's very hard to open that dialogue. So what happens is that you have to construct, uh, by cutting dialogue, but it's not just words. You have to construct parts of words, syllables from different takes. So it was kind of like, a uh, a surgery of, of words and that you don't see, but at least you have to keep the, the energy of the performance, the, the momentum, the fluidity. So they to your ear sounds normal, but there's a lot of things that are trickery that, uh, you don't really see. And with Black Hawk Down, uh, the same thing with action. It wasn't just like action and I'm going to show big explosions and blah, this and that, and they're shooting this. I had to be very specific. I had to be, for myself, I had to be specific to understand not only uh, the cause and effect. I wanted to be precise about this happens and that, why does that happen? And, and also geographically, where are they? You know, who, there's no main character. Whereas that's the opposite. There's 40 characters, but you have to identify. Goodwill Hunting is the opposite. It's about one character. It's about the transformation of character. Very specific. But both movies, uh, I think, for me was, uh, I mean, I l- had a great experience um, on Goodwill Hunting. The use of music, uh, both our love, uh, Gus and I, of, uh, you know, The Graduate, you know, the, the music of Simon and Garfunkel. So we had Elliot Smith. So that was like, you know, also part of the uh, the fabric, you know. I and mean, the final shot is effectively just a very uh, oh, uplifting yeah. version of The End of the Graduate. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally. You got it. Exactly right. That, that feeling. Absolutely right. But, you know, we were working with one, you know, young musician composer that Gus had met in, you know, in Portland, you know, uh, on the streets singing and he had given us cassettes and we were working with those. And then he wrote the song, um, you know, but it was about, I felt like sometimes my experience, you know, uh, maybe personally about transformation, about, you know, moving and, you know, being in one place and, you know, growing as a, as a person and as a character, but to experience, that and being present, like almost you're there around these guys, the reality of that. And Black Hawk Down, and similarly, even though I've never been to war, it was about what does it feel like? What's the experience like of war? We were criticized, and maybe that's why part of the choice to see it again after so many years. At the time when it came out, people, I mean, it was the year of 9-11. We had talked about the the, you know, the, the vulnerability of the United States because there had been already attacks. But the enemy of the United States kind of saw that uh, the United States is not resolute in, resolute in what they wanted to do. They did, came very late in the Bosnian War. They didn't do anything. So they saw weakness and that was part of the theme. And it was like we're, we were working on Black Hawk Down before 9-11 and it became real. You know what I'm saying? And so we had to... The producers saw it. They said, this is very visceral. It's very now. We have to finish it and come out with it. But it, we were criticized when the film came out. Sometimes in Europe, we said, ah, oh, this is another American, you know, pro- war propaganda and, and so forth. Whereas, you know, because they don't show the African side. We don't know who they are. It's always the, 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 the point was, it wasn't that story. The story was, what does it feel like to be a soldier? Yeah. That's as simple as that. What is war like? You know, it doesn't matter, you know, who you shoot at, who they are. When they shoot at, you're being shot at, you know. When you, what does it mean to be a hero when you have to, uh, 
you know, go and save your, your buddy's life. I mean, you can talk about it, but think about it. Would you do it? You know, what does it mean? That, that mentality, that to me was what was, was interesting about uh, the film. I am um, re-watching it recently. I, I was struck at well, how inspired you, you and Ridley Scott must have been by the opening part of Save for Private Ryan. And I thought, you know, yeah. what what an incredible thing to take that that kind of yeah. famously visceral, traumatic yeah. opening that no one had ever seen before and said, what if it was an entire movie? Because it, th- these things don't end. Well, you know? interesting you mentioned that because Ridley said, we got to top that. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that and said, okay, well, yeah, no, it's, a, it's great. Yeah, how are you going to do that? But funny enough, this is a funny story. Uh, work Black Hawk Down. Obviously, uh, I'm out for dinner with friends at a restaurant and uh, I see Spielberg. I tell my friends, oh, look, Spielberg is in there. Oh, yeah, it's good. You know, it comes to that restaurant in the same neighborhood. Uh, and uh, we're waiting to be seated, right? So uh, Spielberg walks out and he sees me because I've known and worked with him. He was a producer on, on Gladiator and came, you know, he produced it with me. So he comes out and people are waiting and I go, oh, Spielberg, Spielberg. And he comes directly to me and he goes, Pietro, how you doing? Oh, good. How, how are you? Right. And people are like, who the hell is this <laughs> guy? You know? And he goes, hey, uh, how's Ridley? I said, good. And the film? Oh, great. You know, we're still working on it. Hey, can you say hi to Ridley and tell him uh, I would like to, uh, to see it? You know, if, if he says, okay, sure, sure, I will. Nice to see you. Next day I tell uh, Ridley, hey, I saw... Stephen, uh, he, he said, you know, was asking about you in the film, you know, anyway, they got together. He came at the cutting room. Oh God. And so oh, God. <laughs> Ridley, Ridley shows him, you know, part of the film and Spielberg is there and he goes, wow, wow. Like this. Oh, nice. Yeah. And really, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Awesome. Awesome thing. So it was, uh. I, I, I like how even Ridley Scott wants a pat on the back from Steven Spielberg. <laughs> yeah, yeah they're, you know, they're, they're, they're friends, but there's always that little underlying competition, which is very healthy. <laughs> I, I wonder with something like Black Hawk Down, which I can't even begin to imagine what the actual script looks like, uh, what, you know, how early you as an editor would be involved in that process. Because I, I would imagine quite early on to ensure that visually it all makes sense. Well, it's not really like that. I mean, the thing is, yeah, I get, uh, even before I uh, start shooting, I get, you know, really tells me that's his next project. The first thing I did was read the book. And uh, it was really interesting. I mean, you know, I remember the uh, the images of the two soldiers being dragged through uh, the streets with powerful images, but then reading the book and understanding that. But then you see, you read the script and you go like, well, this is, doesn't follow a classic a structure. There is no main character. This isn't a classic war film where about the young man returning for war or some man talking about the war experience. It's just like, this is what happens within these 18 hours in this event, very specific, you know. Uh, when the filming started, it was very specific from, really it was very specific that we don't have much time. It's very complex action. There's a lot of moving pieces. Uh, and I'm not going to go and shoot it in, in a way that big action films are done, in the sense that I'm going to break down the action and all these pieces, and then we'll put it together. Ridley is known for uh, storyboarding himself. He has certain visual. He draws it next to his script, visual for him, but it doesn't necessarily follow. It's more a, a tool of communicating to people on the set how he visions, and he has amazing eye, great composition. You can see from, even from his storyboards, we call them Ridley Grams, uh, how the shot will look like. But he chose to shoot everything in one long takes. So with multiple cameras, at times in certain big action scenes, like with up to 11 cameras, helicopter cameras, um, two steady cam cameras, A and B cameras, sometimes a C unit, crash cameras. So shoot the whole scene 
at once, and you end up doing maybe two or three takes. And there's a no, no CGI effects put on it. It's all real. Live action, uh, you know, uh, RPGs on, on wires, uh, uh, explosions. The action was uh, choreographed and orchestrated with, you know, one team crossing a square. Well, we have a steady cam operator behind them. Well, so don't worry about it. We'll take the steady cam operator out afterwards. Oh, we see the crash cameras there or that. We could do that. Well, let's eliminate that. But the idea was, I'm going to capture everything at once. Now, think about it. 10 cameras, 8 to 10 minute takes. How many minutes is that of material? Okay, a lot. But who watches it? I have to. Watch it. <laughs> and sometimes, yeah, you can do it. I can, you know, put the cameras together and see like four cameras or six cameras at the same time from different angles. But they're so different. It's like, you know, it's uh, like individual takes. So you have to imagine I have a vast amount of footage and I have to dig through it because, there, yes, you have a script, you have a specific order of action, but you know, who are they? They all look the same, you know, really had the idea of putting their names on their helmets, at least, which is not authentic, but at least for, for, for movie purposes. But it was for me to understand the geography. And like I said before, the cause and effect of action, who is everybody, who is the team? So getting deeper and deeper, more specific about it, and then being able to go through the material, break it apart and say, okay, I'm going to use this first, but then I have to go to that. And when you shoot everything at once, it doesn't matter you, 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 you captured. Yes, you capture, but you might capture the same moment at the same time. But in movies, it happens sometime later. You know, it's one thing after another. It's, it's linear the action, but you have to give the idea it happens at the same time. So it's this expansion and contraction of time and understanding of geography at the same time. So like I say, it was painful. How long was the edit? Well, you know, it was... A killer because again, you know, we started shooting in the spring and we, we, we get back. I mean, you know, it was probably like uh, 14 or 16 weeks shoot. That's like three and a half, four months, then back to LA. And by, you know, in the summer, by, uh, you know, uh, by uh, September, o October, we, we, we have the first cut. And then 9 11 happened. We had to like stop for two days, you know, the, the event. But then we screened it. And w when we were supposed to finish it uh, the following spring, like in March, and when the producers saw it, uh, they said, no, no, we have to come out. This is very important. It's very, now we, we want to come out. It's a very powerful film. We want to come out before the end of the year. And I go, how? I mean, we have all these shots. We st I mean, it, it was a first cut to show, but we had, you know, visual effects at the time, the whole process, music. Uh, so, uh, and he says, can it be done? I mean, this is Jerry Brokheimer asking me if it can be done. I said, yeah, if we hire, you know, tons of people and work seven days a week, he says, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was, it was, a kill. <laughs> yeah, but also Hans Zimmer's music, you know, he, even the, the way he, he did the music, I used, a lot of tent music, but later the musicians came in and they did a, instead of like oh, looking at the, getting the film in time, writing the music, scoring it, what they did is they looked at the film, they put a bunch of musicians together and started jamming to the images, putting it together, wow. different tracks, different passes. And then two music editors started combining things with what Hans did, with the, these musicians, great musicians in uh, Hans's uh, you know, team. And so it kind of was constructed that way because we didn't have time in order to do it. So I would still edit. I would still uh, make changes, uh, uh, you know, fix dialogue, had to, a lot of dialogue work, obviously, because we had to replace a lot of the, the, the things. We had to do the color. We had to clean up the film, do the effects. Music was coming in. I was editing with the music. So it's just kind of like this giant train trying to finish. And we finished by beginning of uh, uh, December. And Literally, we were still printing, doing our mix, and we uh, and we had you know uh, an, an early film print out of the lab. We were getting the reels, but uh, there was a, a screening scheduled at the academy, you know, a premiere, and we couldn't miss it. And we literally, on the same day of the premiere, we finished the last reel, the seventh reel, and it was stress. I, I just like 
okay, we get, the other reels were already gone. Yeah. They were already starting to build them on a platter. So the last reel was missing, but he said, no, we're going to make it in time. We finish. It was like the screening was at 7, 7.30, finish at 4. I run home. I get a shower, go to the premiere, just like completely stressed, out of breath. Ridley shows up, says, thank you. Very proud to present this film. We literally finished a half hour ago. And everybody says, ha, 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 ha. No, we literally <laughs> finished a half hour ago. <laughs> You know, they couldn't believe it. It was that close. I mean, I suppose that must rank up there towards the top of the films that you've worked on that I guess you had the most practical impact on story because of the nature. Um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting to me that the, the, the subtle differences that you'd have, uh, you know, in your career could, because just to go back quickly to Goodwill Hunting, there's some scenes there, you know, on a, on a rewatch recently, they're so naturalistic. They're almost kind of dogma-like, you know, the, the, the mini driver scenes with Matt Damon and the lightness of touch you must need not to make that kind of crumble or seem false in the edit. It's a very, very different skill to that uh, of, you know, of grappling something like you just explained from Black Hawk Down. Yeah, um, different sensibilities, but it's always about you know, finding the thing that is real, mm. you know, because everything beforehand is kind of like artificial. It's shot, it's done and stuff. But, you know, I mentioned this before, but, you know, when you, when you put something together and uh, the experience that you have as a viewer, that's a real, that's a real thing. It's an emotion. If it's, it affects you, the music or the visuals of the story, you feel it. It's not, fabricated it's yours you know it's it's real if you if it actually works but also you know seeing uh you know the performance you mentioned with uh, the scene mentioned with uh mini driver and matt you know are in the bedroom there's not multiple cameras there's various takes but it's finding the the take the energy to build up that, that of, of how they argue that feels real I, I mean, it's visceral. I loved it. I mean, I know because I reacted like, like that to seeing the raw material. And that's what I want to give back. Mm. Exactly that. And as 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 seamless as I as I can without making it look like without breaking that uh, that that thing of this real that moment when you feel it. But it starts, you know, very early on to be able to capture the viewer and, and maintain that. So in a way, you have to play this. You have a storyteller, obviously. You're going to tell the story. You have a script. You have actors and directors and everybody, you know, uh, uh, creating the story, showing it, build, creating the building blocks to that. But ultimately, when the pieces come together, you have to do justice to all the work that hundreds of people have done, but ultimately also satisfy a viewer, mm -hmm. you know? And so... Um, I, I, I love movies and, uh, you know, I want to be, you know, in the movies just like that. I may be crazy, but Black Hawk Down, there's a bit of it that reminds me of talk radio. The the kind of, the, there's a ticking clock element, uh, you know, there's there's almost a kind of ship in the bottle uh, element to it. Um, well, you know, how, how did you get started on talk radio? How, how do you get working with Oliver Stone? Um, well, I... Uh, you know, when I went back to the States, I mean, I I, um, I got a master's at UCLA, but my intention was always to come back to Europe and to be a filmmaker here in Switzerland. I mean, this was, was my home. Uh, but when I when I, nothing was happening here film wise, I mean, I was interested in documentaries, but I was just like I saw my friends all doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I went back. But it, it was specifically that I, you know, rather than going and being a, a filmmaker or selling my script or doing the movie, I needed to make a living and uh, and I thought that if I want to be a director, the best thing to do is to be, work close to a director to learn mm. you know, how that works. And uh, I had seen Salvador from Oliver Stone. I love that kind of, again, visceral realism, social realism, I would call it, uh, they called, you know, uh, the question that almost feels like a documentary, like, like you there. And um, through sheer uh, chance, I met uh, an assistant that was working with Claire Simpson, who was the editor on Salvador. I, I was introduced to her. I asked her if I could be part of the team in the cutting room. And uh, she said, sure, but, you know, I'm full right now. We're leaving in a few weeks. And they were going off to shoot Platoon, 
Well, then Platoon happened. Best movie, best director, best screenplay, best editor. And I said, I definitely have to work <laughs> with these people. So I went back to Claire and I was offered uh, a position as a second assistant on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And that was my first step, uh, first, uh, you know, encounter with, uh, with Oliver. And so since Oliver was very prolific and uh, great writer, he had one project, again, one year after another, as we were editing or helping that he, he was writing and preparing the next project. So um, he had offered uh, the, it was a small movie, talk radio, but he had offered it to-, to um, It's a great movie. I love that movie. Yeah, it's great. I mean, uh, Eric Bogosian, awesome. Completely great dialogue. Amazing. Yeah. 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 God, his memories come back. I love it. Just like, just think of words, you know, because when you work on a movie, you have these, we, 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 we talk with the same lines of dialogues, but. Uh, uh, I mean, in some ways that's, you know, dead, it's another, another action movie with words, isn't it? it? Exactly. It says dead air, Barry. Yeah. Dead air. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, he had offered the movie to, uh, to David Brennan and Joe Hutching and they were the editors and I was their assistant. And then we went on to do, uh, you know, uh, Born the Fourth of July. And so yeah. both, uh, Joe and David were uh, were the editors. I was like an associate editor. Oliver was moving me up, but Born on the Fourth of July won an Oscar, mm -hmm. won an Oscar for editing, which also was a great script. Excellent performance by Tom Cruise. Real story. He should have won an Oscar. Yes, absolutely right. He, it was awesome what he paid to it. You know, he done other movies, but that was really, That's really, really work, good. Because yeah. we see him as an amazing actor. And then, you know, we did The Doors, and then he moved me up again as co-editor. And then, uh, you know, JFK happened. And at this point, uh, David and Joe didn't want to do it. They were like, ah, not this one. And uh, he asked me if I wanted to do it. And it I was, said- It was a mistake on their part. <laughs> no, no. The fact is that it was a mistake. It's just like, you know, it, w working, you know, long hours, you kind of burn out. But I, it was a great opportunity uh, for me. Joe then eventually uh, came back and uh, we, so we did it together. And there was also other assistants and uh, people that worked with Oliver before that also were on it, uh, on the team. I, I wondered if, with you know, obviously JFK is a, a, a masterpiece and a, a hefty piece of work about one of the more significant people in the 20th century. But I also wondered if there was something quite exciting for an editor to have a film that features live editing of the Zapruder tapes with the back and to the left, back yeah, and to yeah. the left. You know, uh, there there is editing happening inside that film. I, it's yeah. kind of a film about films in some ways. In, yes, uh, it's true. I mean, the, 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 it's it's a real artifact. It's a historic artifact. You can't change it. It's not manipulated. It's not digitally made or you actually see it. Uh, the, the thing is, is that the, the great fortune that uh, Oliver found uh, somebody that had, you know, restored and repurposed the original uh, millimeter uh, film, you know, uh, eight millimeter from, from, from Zapruder at the lab. And he was able to, uh, to make a, um, you know, a, um, I call it from, it was a reversal print. So he made, makes a negative of each frame, then takes each frame and makes an interpositive. But while he was making this interpositive, recomposed uh, and stabilized. So what we got is a print. Okay, then you have an interpositive uh, master. From that, you make a negative, and then from that, a print. But it was, uh, you know, very, very close. I mean, generational-wise, you know, to that film. So when he first showed us that movie, I mean, that clip, and he goes, he called us into a room and says, that's going to be my next movie. You go, like, what? I mean, you heard of the Zapruder film. People have seen it. So, but when the Warren Commission, you know, made their case about the killing and, and they sh list as evidence, uh, you know, the Zapruder film listed by frame numbers and this and this happens and this and this happens. It's not the movie. When you actually see the film, you see what happens, right? Anyway, that became the, the focal point not only of the film, but I mean, of the whole film, but also to go back to that, to that moment from the reconstructions in the opening prologue uh, to returning to Daily Plaza, to understand the, uh, the players, to understand the geography, understand the motivations, the concept of uh, the triangulation of fire, all that thing. It's building up, building up, building up. So by the point you get to the final act in, in, in the case, you're familiar 
yeah. with with all the elements, and then yeah, you break it apart. But it was uh, it was one thing that uh, in terms of editing, how do you uh, represent or how do you make your case? Right, you can be very didactic and say this happened and that happened and that happened. But what we discovered through the editing is that our necessity was to condense a long, long script. And the only way that to, to condense these long sequences was by restructure and by laying scenes on top of scenes. Basically have various uh, lines of narrative happen at the same time. And you say, that's impossible. It's very complicated to follow. It's confusing. But what happened is, is that through the editing, you can follow both a visual narrative, uh, audio narrative through dialogue, uh, um, so if, uh, if the, uh, the visuals are too fast, the dialogue will help. Uh, there's continuity of music, uh, that if, 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 if nothing works, you, you get the, the feeling of the music, sound effects. There are all various uh, modes of narrative that help the viewer visually and w with sound jump from one layer to the next and, and, and get a picture and hopefully at the same time have all the elements present and make their own conclusion. Exactly that. Do you have the facts? Uh, Oliver had a very specific intent and point, and he was also criticized for that. But, you know, we were criticized for the fact that we were manipulating, you know, archival footage. What do you mean? It is that. It's just the context that's different. We're not manipulating. Yes, we manipulate because you have, you know, we have to recreate uh, you know, archival footage of Oswald being paraded through the, uh, you know, Dallas uh, police hall, but we had to put Gary Oldman in it. You know, yes, we're manipulating that, but it's through the editing to give uh, uh, the feel that uh, it's 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 real. And but at the same time, for the viewer to have the option to make up their own mind. You know, you you were talking about um, the pressure surrounding Black Hawk Down after nine eleven. Um, I imagine the working on a film about the murder of. JFK just comes naturally with that pressure built in. Did it, did it feel like a, a, did you feel under pressure to not mess it up? Did everybody on the team feel as though this was a specifically important project for America? Um, I mean, we felt the pressure in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the vastness of the project, the history moment, but also I think, I think we felt really confident in being in uh, Oliver's hands because he's very smart, a uh, student of history. He loved that subject, he had done a lot of research. So a lot of times, you know, we would have uh, elements, uh, historic elements uh, that, uh, you know, he, we would incorporate for special black ops. If we talk about Lumumba or Mossadegh's killing in Iran, the CIA behind, who was behind it? These are things that I learned by doing the research through, through all of it. I mean, I didn't know all that stuff, you know? So we really were relying on, on Oliver a lot and, and in terms of having that, that, uh, the, uh, you know, the expertise and the confidence to do that. We were just trying to, uh, again, just dramatically, uh, bring that to, fru you know, fruition and, and to uh, make it accessible. But what happened is, is that yes, it actually, it had a, a, a cause and effect that after the film, even though it was criticized for the point of view, that there was a, an opening and uh, a congressional hearing about releasing certain yeah. documents. And it did happen. And the thing is, maybe the, the possibility of a conspiracy. You see, if the two people get it, yes, it's open to that. It's open to interpretation. So it did change history slightly, or at least give the possibility of opening up. Oh, I think it entirely did. I think it was a phenomenon, you know? Um, so look, I mean, you, you know, Oliver Stone, we've talked about Ridley Scott, but you've also worked with, you know, basically all my favorite directors, Sam Raimi, <laughs> Michael Mann currently. You know, when you're working with people with such careers and I suppose power in Hollywood, do you, do you find that you have a... Uh, is, is there a regular way that you approach all the work or is it all about different relationships with the different directors? Um, yeah, my work is the same. I mean, I really go deep into it. I, I love what I do, but it's really uh, at the service of, of story. But, uh, you know, my relationship with the directors is really about 
it's it's a cliche, but it's really about bringing the the, the director's vision through, you know, uh, to alive and bring bring it to to conclusion somehow. Uh, but uh, in, in different relationships, it's just a different work method how people like to work, you know. But all relationships are based on uh, an element of of, of trust uh, on both sides, but also element of. Uh, you know, for, for me to listen, but also to have uh, the, the freedom to express my opinion or to challenge or to help or say we need that, you know, and, and, and to be heard, you know, it's not a just one way thing because ultimately the, when you're in the cutting room, that's it. I mean, you know, you're making the film that people are going to see. The choices you make are, are very critical, you know, and you try to avoid outside influence because I know that sometimes when we work in the cutting room and I'm mean, working with Bertolucci and he would always have visitors come in, you know, and oh, come and say hi. And it kind of like disrupts this kind of vacuum, this bubble you're in because you get lost You're in the movie and you work and it always breaks down. But, you know, I kind of like, I continue working and, you know, he talks and he has a cup of tea and so forth. And, you know, I know he doesn't like somebody being in there, but he, he has to do it. So one time this uh, AD comes by, you know, and it's just quiet. I edit, you know, because he was just sitting in the background and she opens her mouth and she goes like, ah, but you know, remember, he says, Bernardo Tenzin says, we don't talk in the cutting room. <laughs> this is a sacred place. <laughs> no talking. <laughs> it's true because it breaks it. Yeah, of course. Another time uh, they were doing a 60 minute report on, uh, on Ridley. Yeah. And they said, can we come in the cutting room? They did the interviews of following him around, but they wanted to come in the cutting room. And says, really says, 60 minutes is coming in. Really? Yeah. You know, the guy, and they wanted to see the process. So we're in the room and, okay, pretend. <laughs> Fake what? work. Yeah, yeah, talk, like, just pretend. You know, nothing was happening. So after like 50 minutes, people said, this is really boring. And they left. As soon as they left, okay, great. <laughs> it was like completely the opposite. It's true. <laughs> It's true, when, when you have somebody else in the room, I can feel their eyes. Yeah, of I course. can feel, that's when you're in, in the movie theater, it's the same thing, yeah. I can feel it. So yes, it's, you don't want outside interference. So look, last question, I mean, your, I guess what, your next film that's coming out is Ferrari yeah. by, by Michael Mann. As uh, an Italian, is that, uh, is that a passion project? Well, uh, yes, I mean, uh, Ferrari, I mean, being Italian, loving cars, I mean, he's, he's an Italian icon, one of the biggest Italian icon. I mean, worldwide, it's it's you know, world brand now. I mean, but f it was a passion project for uh, Michael Mann for many years. I mean, I've known Michael for a long time. Uh, I, mean, I love his movies, you know, obviously Heat and all, amazing filmmaker, great, absolutely. So, but uh, he, uh, he was, you know, just on social occasion, I'd run into him, you know, different places he would say he had this project, he would love me to, to do it. I said, oh, that'd be awesome, you know? And so I, I, um, I, I'd read several versions of it because it was almost on the go. I mean, this is even, you know, when you've done like uh, a film with uh, The Insider, you know, no, with yeah. Russell Crowe. I mean, even though I know Russell had offered it to him at that point, so many years ago. But always something you want to do, and he would uh, call me. I'm ready to go. I have the money to do this. You know, I'm going to start in three months. He would like you to do it. I said, thanks, but I, I don't think I can. I'm going to do Ridley's film. I said, that happened once, twice, three times. And then finally says, when are you going to stop working for Ridley? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, this time around, the timing worked, and uh, I got had the you know the awesome experience to work with Michael. Um, I, I actually. I, I, I just quickly wanted to know your perspective because, you know, um, JFK, enormous historical piece flicking between color and black and white to talk about a controversial part of American history. It is very obviously being compared to Oppenheimer <laughs> currently. Oh, yeah. And I've wondered if you'd seen Oppenheimer. No, but I'm looking forward. I'm going back next week. I mean, I definitely want to see it on the big screen on IMAX. I'm really looking forward to that. I mean, yes, I want to see how uh, Chris intends to receive sound. I love it. And so, uh, yes, I'm looking forward to seeing it. The editing is amazing. Oh, yeah. no, he's, I, I heard, I heard. That's uh, well, look. Uh, 
Pietro Scilla, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, have a nice rest of the holiday. Thank you so Cheers. much. Bye-bye.